Okay. I hear a lot of background noise at the moment. So, okay, that's better. Yeah. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, I want to thank you all for thinking along with me and thinking of ways to support me. I'm really, really happy with that, and I'm also really happy that the recording worked out, uh, which I put on YouTube. Um, so that is great. And I have received six questions, I see. Um, so that would be nice to, uh, uh, to get into. I don't think we can actually do all six, but we can see how far we can, uh, we can get. Um, so the first question I saw here is the question of, uh, on egregores, how to become aware of which egregores you're a part of and how to connect or disconnect with them more consciously? Um, well, that is a tricky question. Um, first of all, I should say there are various uh, categories of, of egregores. Uh, so the simplest categories are basically the really, um, yeah, the smaller egregores, which are limited uh, to, for instance, your city or your country or your, your people. So these egregores are very specific, actually, yeah, not just to our solar system or to our planet, but just actually to a small part of our planet. Um, so these are the smallest egregores, and these egregores, they act in a way like a recording device. So a, uh, a group, a, a city or a nation or a region uh, can have a certain mission, can have a certain energy. And um, out of that energy, uh, a purpose can come. So, for instance, um, one of the things I can talk about, I recently went to, to Hungary for me for the first time. And they really f felt there that they had a, uh, a role, in a way, in preserving kind of the European tradition and the European ways. And they acted like a like a blockage against the influences from Mongolian herds and from the Ottoman Empire. So they acted like a buffer and this was part of their purpose. And now it is very tricky because the Ottoman Empire is gone and the Mongolian hordes are gone. So what is then the purpose of uh, yeah, the, the Hungarian agricore? So these egregores, you can also see that they are not just local, but they're also very temporary. And it is very difficult if you have been part of an egregore and you're still stuck a little bit in the, in the past um, job of the egregore. So the egregore needs to renew itself and sometimes it also needs to be destroyed and uh, rebuilt to suit the current people if new people move into the region or the region itself changes because of climate changes or um, sea level changes. So what you see often is that these yeah, um, kind of smaller egregores, um, they take a couple of yeah, hundred years to, uh, to form. So in general you can, you can say that if something is not at least a hundred years old, it probably won't have an egregore. And when it has a few hundred years, then usually it's, yeah, it starts to build up an energy, get some consistency. Um, so the building up of an egregore has to do a lot with, with the harmony. Uh, is the group involved in the same goal? Do they have the same vision? Do they have the same ideas about how to achieve that goal? Uh, about the amount of energy, the amount of power which is there. But also the amount of support they receive from the higher world. So even a relatively small area or relatively small city, if they receive a lot of support from angels or gods or goddesses, they can more quickly build up an egregore. Um, so besides these uh, smaller egregores, you also have to look at kind of when they were founded. So if you look at the older egregores, there are basically egregores which are more um, corresponding to 
more primitive levels of evolution. So the oldest aggregors, they are involved with the geological processes of the planet and the creation of new species. So they have a very long-term view of things. I had the pleasure of encountering one of these uh, members of, of the aggregors, uh, of the old aggregors in Australia, um, where the aboriginals actually still communicate with them. And um, yeah, their, their time span is usually millions of years. So in a way our idea of development and spiritual development is not really in accordance to how they view things. Um, and these egregores, they are more, um, in a way, the caretakers of our universe. They try to con they create conditions which are beneficial for other egregores and other life forms. Um, and these um, yeah, larger egregores who really want to arrange the energies of planets, um, they also have contact usually with other solar systems. These are part of larger egregores. So even though they are specific to our planet or active on our planet, they are actually trying to create yeah, life forms which are useful also for spirits from other planets. Um, the more yeah, uh, comprehensible, uh, comprehensible egregores for us uh, start with the nature egregores. The nature egregores, they don't really have an idea of good or evil or light or darkness or things like that. They haven't gone into dualism as much as, uh, as we have. Uh, so the whole dualistic concepts won't really, yeah, are not really comprehended by them. And they also don't wish to get involved or to take sides in battles between good or evil no. or things like this. Um, they're more um, attuned to just natural forces, natural powers, and how we can interact with them. But these nature egregores, they don't try to guide us so much, uh, as, but they're rather more interested in supporting us, in helping us grow, in helping us to be healthy, and uh, creating an environment which is very healthy, which is very strong. In, uh, in impulses. If you look more towards the, um, uh, the human egregores or the, the cultural egregores, um, we find that uh, there are egregores which are very closely linked to, to religions or to a certain pantheon. And pantheon is, is basically a, a way of relating to forces. So, for instance, um, if you look at the, uh, the Roman and the Greek pantheon, they have a certain philosophy, like a hero uh, should be smart, it sh he should be cunning. And if you look at the Nordic pantheon, the hero should have a lot of perseverance and acceptance of fate. Um, and if you look at, uh, for instance, uh, yeah, the Islamic religion, it's a lot about obedience, about humility. And if you look at the Christian panth religion, it is a lot more about love and compassion, and mercy and forgiveness. And from all these, um, in all these different ways, you can relate to all the energies and all the forces around us. So often a religion will form a, an egregore, but more commonly it will be a, a collection of egregores who are working along a similar principle of, of growth. And, or a similar way of relating to the, to the forces which exist. Um, to become aware of what egregores you're working with, it is necessary to develop what is called the long will. Um, the uh, long will is actually something which can be observed by clairvoyant people. If you um, look at the, um, the pubic bone, um, there is a, a structure which is kind of like protruding from the pubic bone. Uh, so it is literally coming out of your, uh, out of your belly forward. Um, and this is basically uh, the structure which anchors you through different lifetimes. And what you see is usually if this, the size of this 
energetic structure is like more than 20 or 30 centimeters, then you start to get consistency over different lifetimes. So then your will, your focus is so strong that you will continue with what you are doing, even though you die. Um, so this is in a way a measure of discipline, like how much distraction can you take. And if not even death will distract you anymore, or will make you give up, or make you think of something else, then you have developed what is called the long will. And the long will is actually invo involved in all spiritual progress, not just in working with egregores. Um, because the long will uh, allows you to weave together various lifetimes. And that also means that you can start using the skills and the knowledge you have built up in your previous lifetimes. And usually after spending about four to six lifetimes yeah, working on a single uh, goal or a single subject, um, then we start to develop talents and memories and skills. And usually if you go more between 12 and 20 lifetimes, when you focus on the same subject, you start to be born actually with knowledge already. Uh, so instead of having to read books or to learn things in other ways, the knowledge will just come to you or you will know things without ever reading them or without hearing them from other places. And so the more lives you spend on something, the easier it will get to rebuild that knowledge in your, in your next incarnation. And the egregores are a very important part of this process of rebuilding. Um, one of the things an egregore will do to help you to rebuild is to try to trigger those memories. So the egregore will try to send people or events or your way or to lead you or inspire you to go to places where you've been before in your previous lives. So those memories from those previous lives can awaken more easily and you can integrate them in your current life. Uh, it is important though if those memories awaken that you realize that uh, you are in a new incarnation. You don't have to repeat or do the same thing as in your previous lives because that would be rather useless. So in my case I've spent uh, about four incarnations as a shaman and that means that in my current incarnation I can easily use shamanic techniques but my purpose in this life is not to be a shaman again um, because I've had those experiences, I've had those lives so it is not really a useful path for, for growth for me anymore it is just a tool which I can use to, to deal with my problems so your tool set, in a way, starts to increase over uh, various lifetimes. Um, in relating to, to these egregores, it is most easy to do if you are isolated from competing egregores. Because as I said, like there are local egregores which are of low vibration in your city, in your country, in your people. Um, and if you work in a big mega company, even in your, uh, in your work, and the easiest way is to go to a place where there have not recently at least been these types of, uh, of energies. So the easiest thing is to yeah, either go into the desert or a forest or a mountain top or um, out onto the sea or some other place where you're at least a couple of hundred meters away from any... Um, yeah. Um, energy which may be locked in, in the countryside because even if there are no people there at present the people who have lived there those energies will be recorded by the stones and the minerals um, and will be in a way replayed and uh, they form an energetic pattern which will trap you again. So another way to very easily um, uh, liberate yourself is to, to go underwater or into a cave um, those are also very good ways to, to separate yourself, to isolate yourself from the yeah, general background noise of, uh, of energy. Um, you also need to quiet those voices in yourself, to purify yourself. And this can be done through, uh, through meditation. And um, once you have achieved this um, yeah, a clean environment and also a clean energy body, um, then you can start trying to remember 
the principles of your of your past lives and uh, you can do this by focusing on your uh, base chakra your first chakra uh, because actually when your spirit enters the body it connects to the body it brings those energies with it and the whole area of the pelvis and also the lower part of the spine it can carry a lot of memories from these previous lives and also from the period you spent in between lives because if you're connected to an egregore then usually after death you will go back to the egregore to store part of your knowledge part of your um, the things you've learned or acquired so they can be used by other people but also you can use them again if you reincarnate and then when you incarnate you can take part of the knowledge with you or you can leave it with the egregore so it is really important to try to build up a memory not just of your previous lives but also of the period in between your incarnations to find out where did you go there or what have you been doing before you incarnated and this can be really yeah, helpful um, so often you will get also an inspiration to travel to a certain place or to be focused on a certain time like I know people from Australia who have an absurd fascination with everything Japanese or people from the Ukraine who have a fascination with Japan um, and uh, often these fascinations with a certain yeah, country or culture or period um, there are also links to your egregorial past and traveling there uh, is often really also very useful for reawakening those powers, those memories. Um, another factor which you can do is to try to find a place where you're no longer influenced by um, astrological powers. Um, so there is a, a special kind of astrology which looks at the positive and the negative side of every planet depending on your uh, date of birth and place of birth and um, that forms a kind of a grid on the earth um, and by being either on the left hand side or the right hand side of such a line you are in an area of where that planetary energy is positive or negative but there are also crossing points where that energy is more or less neutral or at least neutral for several planets and visiting such places can also be very useful to really find out who am I, what am I doing, um, without being pulled in, in either a positive or a negative pattern by these planetary forces. And ultimately the goal is that your spirit becomes strong enough and skilled enough to deal with all these planetary forces, whether positive or negative. But until we reach that point, this is also a very nice way to travel and a perfect place to, to meditate and to focus on really getting to know yourself. Um, when it comes to connecting and disconnecting to egregores, um, usually the, um, the connection uh, is not really formalized until the person's personality has, has stabilized. Um, so, as I said, with women it's usually in their late 20s, with men it's around 40, when the personality has become a very stable structure. Uh, the reason for this is that um, if you get power but your personality changes too much you might start using the power for very different goals. So they really want to see more or less what is your, your pattern, what is your moral character before really allowing you uh, to reintegrate with those, uh, with those energies completely. Um, Often the, the process of reintegration can be done very formally uh, by being initiated by a person who is already a member of the egregore or you can get a deeper initiation if the other person is like on a higher tier of the egregore. So they can open uh, yeah, certain parts of that astral city uh, to you. So in a way certain gates are closed until you have reached a certain level of advancement yourself or until you're invited in or there is a person who will guide you and protect you and in a way um, their word is their bond for your good behavior so you're allowed in not because of what your own capabilities are but because 
your teacher or your master or the person who initiates you is uh, well respected within that egregore. Uh, sometimes egregores will also grant uh, temporary access if you have a specific task to do which has a lot to do with that egregore. So for instance if you're a part of a healing egregore but you're not very advanced yet or your personality is not yeah, really perfected yet but if you want to heal somebody they will temporarily allow you access to that egregore so you can do your work and then they take it away again. Um, often this is also done to protect the person from identifying with the power of the egregore. So the powers in the egregore are always uh, in a way shared powers. They're not your power, it is not your, your property, it's communal property and you can borrow it if you're a good member of the, of the community. Um, the other thing about um, yeah, working with, with these egregores when you, it comes to disconnecting um, is kind of like um, leveling the score or, the, or settling the balance. Um, often an, an egregore will, uh, will invest in you and um, we live in a, in, a, in a universe of balance. So if the egregore has invested in you more than you have done for it, then you are allowed to leave if you pay your debt. So they might require you to do certain things before you are allowed to leave. Um, or it can be the other way around, that you actually have a positive credit with that egregore and uh, they will yeah, often uh, compensate that by improving your karma and improving the karma is also uh, removing certain impurities, certain tendencies which are um, yeah, unuseful or negative or which you've already learned but still not really cleansed. Um, so what we often see in our, in our growth process is that we get a problem or a challenge to learn from it and often this problem or challenge uh, creates a lot of emotional turmoil or uh, damage in our energy bodies or our physical bodies. And once we've learned the lesson, then we have grown, uh, but there can be scars leaving, left behind by our process of learning. Um, so for instance, if I have to learn to be, uh, to be brave, um, I might get into very dangerous situations where I have to fight for my life, and afterwards I've learned to be brave, I learn to overcome my fear, but because of all these fights and struggles maybe I'm, yeah, I'm still wounded either physically or emotionally or have nightmares. And these are the kind of things which egregores tend to help you with or to remove as a compensation uh, for the things you, do, you did for them if you don't want to uh, cooperate with them anymore. Um, the separation from, uh, from an egregore can also be undone, like any initiation can be undone by a person who's uh, a master or a mistress in that egregore, in that tradition. Um, if you talk about light egregores, this is usually uh, quite easy uh, to, uh, to enter or to go out. They tend to be relatively open-minded. Um, if you talk about dark egregores, it is very often um, also a reverse a system of recruitment. So to enter into a light egregore you need to yeah, work hard, work well, prove yourself worthy, then you're allowed in. And uh, if you have enough purity uh, and other qualities. With the dark egregore it's very easy to get in. So they will just say like, okay, you want to, to get our help, that is fine. Uh, sign here on the dotted line and you're part of the egregore and the egregore will support you. So it is just like a credit card company. It's very easy you to get the credit card and then you very easily build up a debt and then you're in trouble because paying off the debt is, is kind of a difficult process. Uh, this is also the, the goal of dark egregores. Dark egregores try to, they're looking for quantity rather than for quality. And with light egregores it's usually the opposite, they look for quality, not so much for quantity. Um, so it tends to be, in 
at least our current day and age, that dark aggregors are um, relatively stronger, have more members uh, than light aggregors. Um, but it's also a relative weakness because like there's a lot of numbers so a lot of energy there but often there are not most of the members are not very skilled at uh, at working with them but for the, the higher layers of these aggregors uh, they don't have to have a lot of personal power because they can use the power of all the other members of the aggregor so in a way the darker aggregors tend to use their lower tier members as slaves or sources of energy. Um, so it's pretty much like a political party you could say, where like the political party gets power by the donations and the votes of the of the members. And but all the control, all the power is really with a small top layer um, who actually runs uh, runs things. And um, because you're considered food by the, by the top members, uh, they're often reluctant to let you go easily. Um, but also uh, uh, dark aggregors are bound to certain laws and regulations, but they often have to be reminded of these laws and regulations, um, since they will not let go of you uh, just by themselves. So often what you will need to do is really to follow a very different path and then you can apply to, uh, to judges. So in the Christian tradition uh, you can go to St. Peter or Jesus or um, uh, Mother Mary um, or in the Vedic tradition you can go to uh, the Lords of Karma, Lord Yama and you can bas basically say like um, I don't fit here anymore. Look at my karma, look at my patterns. And um, yeah, from the perspective of divine justice, should I still be here? And you can also ask these powers to intervene on your behalf. So you can ask these yeah, um, gods or saints to, in a way, uh, uh, yeah, pay your debt to make you free so that you will owe instead you will owe to Lord Yama or to Jesus instead of to the dark aggregor. So this is one very positive way in which these light powers can intervene by absorbing some of your debt um, and you can pay them off to them instead of to the dark aggregor and this makes also the tasks you have to do or the things you have to perform uh, a lot nicer because if you are part of a dark aggregor they will usually ask you to um, work on their goals, on their uh, furthering their agenda for the world uh, and that can have bad karmic consequences so even while you're trying to get rid of the aggregor you can get more stuck into the dark side by trying to get out of it and asking for this yeah, higher power to intervene um, that yeah, you can in, in a way do positive things to get out of it Okay, let me see if there's more questions. And I noticed... Okay, I see your comment about the 12 steps program in, uh, in addiction. Um, well... <laughs> Uh, it, it, it does have a lot of things in common actually. Uh, so first you have to, to realize that you have a problem, you have to admit that you're, that you're in this situation and you have to uh, acknowledge your, your position because, before you can work on it. Because often people who are connected to these dark aggregors, they will receive dreams or inspirations from these dark aggregors. So they will often have feelings of being possessed or being haunted um, by these dark aggregors and they will see it as an outside influence like there is some evil thing chasing me without realizing that they're actually a part of the evil thing which is chasing them and they can't run away from it because it is part of them they're connected to it and that is actually also an internal force their in internal impurities 
whether they're from this life or from a previous incarnation, which are still having that those effects. And it can be quite tricky because these dark egregores, I've had cases where they really hounded a person for four incarnations. So even if a person goes back and remembers his previous or his previous two incarnations, it can be even further back that they are really unwilling to, to let go of, um, of their prey. Um, and indeed, uh, um, um, yeah, looking for other people um, in this process of salvation is, uh, is a great help. And for me, actually, the, um, the, the Christian way um, is the best way to, to get rid of um, these agrocores. Because um, most powers are really um, yeah, connected to, to one egregore or another. So you often end up switching egregores rather than getting free of them. Uh, so if I want to get rid of one egregore, I can ask another egregore, which is, for instance, I'm in a dark egregore, I ask their enemy. So like, okay, listen, I want to desert my egregore and join the other side. And they will help you, of course, because they can turn you from an enemy into an ally, into a friend. Um, but then you're still stuck in the same war, in the same uh, pattern, you're just on the opposite side. Um, it can be a good thing, it can be a useful thing, but um, it is not really a step of yeah, getting out of it totally. But the higher you, the powers you, uh, you go to, so not so much with, with the lower gods and goddesses, but if you go to beings which are enlightened or above, uh, so enlightened masters, angels, um, um, or indeed uh, yeah, uh, messiahs, um, um, those powers, the Holy Spirit, they can really liberate you out of this whole system of egregores because being part of an egregore is also like a karma, it's also a pattern. You go back into life after life after life until you break it. Or until, in a way, the path within that egregore is fulfilled. And then you naturally evolve into a higher egregore. Because egregores are also a kind of a pyramid system. So you can start out with a very uh, primitive egregore, so for instance, like a, the Hungarian uh, knighthood. For instance, you want to fight for your country, and after you've learned how to do that, you can see a bigger picture that, oh gosh, I'm not just fighting for my country, I'm actually fighting for um, yeah, preserving the, the innocent, uh, preserving our culture or beauty, and then you yeah, join higher egregores, which are actually about preserving beauty, not so much for a specific country or against one specific enemy. And after fighting for beauty for a while it becomes bigger still so it's not just about beauty but it is harmony or justice uh, all included so it becomes higher and higher and higher as you move from one egregore into a higher egregore and ultimately um, yeah many people who are members of the school have heard of the central star which is basically the, the the place where the intelligences are highest in our local uh, part of the of the galaxy, which is Orion, and ultimately you can yeah start to work for or be a part of this Orion egregore, which is very involved in um, yeah determining the method of uh, of evolution, spiritual evolution within their solar systems. So you come more of a, of a neutral judge who is in a way just uh, guiding evolution um, and you have to be uh, also to recognize the value of the dark egregores because they also have a part in that growth in that evolution and um, but it is like like a garden it has to be maintained uh, to be beautiful to bear fruit to have optimal conditions and if you don't maintain it it tends to go bad, but the higher egregores are about uh, these activities. Okay, let's... I talk too much. <laughs> uh, okay. 
Ja. Yes. Okay, so um, yeah, with this, um, uh, the question is about the, the oneness movement. What egregores are related to that, or or are egregores being uh, built by this uh, by this movement? Um, it is actually um, not so much a a, a new egregore. It is just an an already existing egregore and it's basically a little bit on the on the border um, between on the one hand the um, the luciferical cosmos and the other hand the nature cosmos so there's very collective elements in it but also very individual uh, elements in it um, so what you could say of it is that actually the the methods are mainly luciferical in nature, so they're focused on self-improvement. Uh, but the ultimate goal is also about about sharing uh, the powers, sharing the the benefits. Um, the um, the egregore it's, itself is a relatively uh, small, a relatively uh, young egregore. Um, so. It's also not originating actually uh, from this planet, but rather from another planet. Uh, uh, it is, yeah, come here. It is in a way sent a, a spirit here, which uh, or several, which started to incarnate in human bodies to kind of manifest this uh, this type of learning, uh, this type of growth. Um, if I look at it. Um, um, I have to say it is it is uh, not really completely light nor completely dark. It's more of a grayish egregore, you could say, um, because one of the things it is it is doing it is actually like really skirting the borders of what is allowed by the by the divine laws. Um, so what the oneness movement is involved in. Is actually uh, integrating or adding power structures to the energy body of the uh, of the individual who becomes part of the movement. So in a way, um, you receive an yeah an artificial organ, uh, you could say, to to help your energy body. And um, because of this implantation, the energy body has certain qualities or certain powers, which give it certain possibilities and certain rights. So it is in a way, um, like there used to be a series on TV, the, the Six Million Dollar Man, who had all these mechanical limbs and could jump very high and was very strong. And in the same way, you are yeah, added prothesis, which give you this power and give you the strengths and these abilities. Uh, but these are not developed by yourself. Um, so your right to these abilities and to these powers is a little bit iffy, uh, so to say. So on the one hand you can claim, yes, it is part of my energy body, so I can use it. But on the other hand, um, the risks are, because you have not really 
built it yourself um, that those powers are not used in the right way or actually that another being or the egregore itself will uh, use those powers possibly against you. Uh, so the higher members of the egregore who actually do the implanting they have control over those implants and uh, in that way they can in a way um, this is also a technique which is used a lot for colonization of um, of other planetary systems. So one of the things they could do using these implants, I'm not saying that they are doing it, but is actually to remove the original spirit, throw it out of the body, so that a spirit from their own planet can incarnate into the body. And I know several egregores from other planets who actually use these methods to, yeah, to conquer other, uh, other solar systems by basically taking over the bodies of the highest life forms on those planets. Um, so the oneness movement is a little bit um, dangerous, I would say, to, uh, to become a part of. Um, if I look at the, at the higher guide, guidance within that, uh, that egregore, there are no um, angels uh, involved. Uh, so it has no divine guidance. Uh, there are people involved who have uh, reached a state of enlightenment. But enlightenment makes one neither light nor dark, it just frees a person's will. And your will can be dark or light. So in essence you can still be dark and enlightened or light and enlightened. Um, and it doesn't really distinguish between them. It is just about bringing persons to a certain uh, state. Um, but not so much about yeah, transforming. Um, not so much about real transformation and of course you can use the powers you get to work on your transformation but this is not really supported by the egregore itself so it seems to be more focused on uh, developing on building power rather than transforming the consciousness or, uh, or the spirit um, if I look at the, the collective part of the egregore um, uh, what I see is that in a, in a way the junior members of the egregore are not really in control. So it is a little bit of a pyramid system as I said before with political parties where the elder members really uh, retain control and use the younger ones for, for power or for energy or as tools. Uh, so that is very much the case. Uh, if we look at the, the goals um, they're very much about uh, improving the growth rate or the evolutionary rate on this planet. So they see a lot of potential in, uh, in human beings and they want to teach human beings more about their potential, about, more about their capacities. So if it comes to the spiritual development side of things, they're definitely uh, improving humanity uh, when it comes to that. So they're not focused they're really helping us to focus away from the material and from the mechanistic. Uh, so they also have a very positive influence. Um, do you have more questions about this movement, Ninka? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, yeah, so I will just repeat the question. Um, uh, you went to a, a meeting and during the meeting a golden ball appeared and entered into the crown chakra and connected you to, uh, to that egregore. Um, this is yeah, always a risk of going to, to groups because in groups the energy can be stronger than you can individually resist. One on one meeting is generally safe. If there are four or more people uh, in the group then the energy can overpower you. 
or things can happen which you don't agree with. Um, um, but yeah, you thought that the energy was gone, but it is not. In general, most uh, most initiations or connection processes, they um, um, work for one lifetime. So, uh, in general, um, if you if you die, you are rid of the initiations, and but during your life, the connection will will remain. But if you don't use it, if you don't focus on that group, it will go dormant. And this is also what happened uh, in your case. So by not working with it, not focusing on it, not paying attention to it, it just went to sleep. And it is not bothering you and it's, yeah, when you change bodies it will not come with you. Uh, it is possible to give really high initiations which, are re re yeah, which have such an amount of subtle energy that they actually affect your spirit. Uh, but this was a low level initiation, uh, so it is not uh, dangerous in that sense. Um, as to removing it, because if you do get a lot of these dormant energies in your energy body, they also clog the flow, like even though they're not doing much, they're like stones in a river, and they still slow down your own internal processes. Um, because you do need to maintain them and they draw a little bit of energy from you. Um, the easiest thing to do is to uh, uh, to return it, and I think that with this egregore it is quite simple to to return it. They are not very uh, very aggressive or very pushy, and they will just accept it if you uh, yeah meditate again, focus on the ball, which is actually um, um, in your in your lower back. So it focused yeah, slightly above your, uh, the rear of your second chakra. So if you uh, meditate on it again and you can just hand it back to the egregore or to the master who you, uh, who you got it from. Um, so you should be able to, uh, to rid yourself of this. And I can check next week to see if it, uh, if it all went well. <coughs> Uh, let me see. Okay. <laughs> um, so I have a second question here. What is the influence or strength of the planets? And are there ways to be more conscious about these influences? Um, the, the influence of the planets is, is a very personal thing. Um, as a spirit, we uh, have a certain amount of experience in our solar system. And um, the, the planets actually, or the planetary energies, are in a way what our energy bodies are made of. So we're made out of Sun and Earth, Moon, Venus and Mars. And um, these different planets, we use them to uh, compose different parts of our energy body. So our um, active dominant side we make out of Mars energy, our uh, soft uh, meek side we make out of Venus energy, our consciousness we create out of the Sun, our subconsciousness we create out of the Moon, our uh, rational thought uh, we create uh, uh, out of Mercury, our ability to attract things um, yeah, we create out of, out of Jupiter and our um, in a way our challenges we create out of Saturn energy and it is very much depending on the skill of our spirit how much um, uh, these energies correspond with the desires of our spirit so if we have a perfect spirit with perfect skill then the planet, planets won't affect us at all we will rule the planet, our spirit can rule and transform all the planetary energies and there is no, yeah, no trouble. So it is like, um, like you're an excellent swimmer, and of course you have tides and and flows, and uh, the river can, yeah, can be low or it can be high depending on the amount of rainfall. But because you can swim well, you can still go where you need to go. But it just requires more or less effort for your spirit, depending on how the energy flows. But if the spirit is not so strong, 
then um, it is not so much of you will always succeed but have to give more effort but sometimes success can be impossible because the flow is too strong you yeah you cannot go against it so at certain periods in your life depending on the planetary energy things might be impossible or possible and if you look at astrology and basically based on your birth horoscope and the relation you have with the planet it's the flow will be positive or negative for you it will help you or hinder you um, also the uh, personality we construct is often uh, reflected by our birth horoscope so every element uh, for instance my my venus uh, it can um, work in, in various ways and those ways are determined by the signs so our my venus can be very earthy or watery or airy or fiery depending on what type of uh, element it is in and also depending on the maturity of the element so if my uh, venus is in uh, a young element one of the first four signs of the zodiac then it is very childish, very outgoing, very focused on the outside, so with very little self-awareness. So if my Venus is in, in one of the young signs, then I will just go along with whatever and I will be very meek and easygoing and uh, I will adapt fully to whatever is around me. And if it is in one of the, the last signs, so the last signs of the zodiac, it will be very focused on self-awareness so I will be adopting, uh, transforming myself, working on myself uh, to be more aligned with myself rather than with the outside world and if it is in the middle four signs there is a balance between the in internal influences and the internal focus and the external influences and the external focus and depending on the element it will also manifest in a different way so if it is an earth element it will usually manifest in a very physical <coughs> um, material sense if it is on a water element it will manifest in an emotional sense um, in an air element in a, a mental sense and if it's in a fire element in a spiritual sense so by looking at your birth horoscope you can often understand a little bit of your spirit by looking at the choices your spirit made you can understand what type of personality um, have I built and what is my spirit like and um, if you yeah, gauge a little bit the amount of control which your spirit has over the different types of, uh, of planet you can also see what are your tools because if I'm very skilled at Venus then and this is a tool for me in my life and if I'm very bad at Saturn for instance and this is a big problem in my life, a challenge, something I need to, to learn, to focus on in my life, to develop that skill and there's actually a, a type of Reiki which I also give initiations in called Rainbow Reiki so instead of uh, the Usui technique focuses only on the Sun but with Rainbow Reiki I focus on all the planets and you get a mix of all the different planets and this type of Reiki is very good in helping to support the development of your personality or the personality of other people who you treat and resolving the personality issues and personality problems so it's a very psychological type of Reiki which I uh, yeah, created in this way it's not so much my creation it is rather a recreation um, because already in, uh, in old times, in Egyptian times, people used to talk with the planetary spirits and learn from them and work with them and um, uh, these planetary spirits, because they form your personality or part of your personality when they help you, that part of the personality can develop very quickly, very strongly and when they hinder you, then that part of your personality can be yeah, very hard, very difficult uh, to overcome but we actually move from treating everything as a person as a fellow intelligence to a mechanistic universe so we don't see the planets anymore as a person 
or as two persons because they have a male and a feminine side but now we see them just as an impersonal force and we are more comfortable relating to them as an impersonal force so instead of relating to the sun as actually a group of six solar spirits we relate to it as one energy source in the Usui system and personally I like relating to them as, as persons because you can have a conversation with them, build up a relationship and learn a lot more easily but most people are now more into this mechanistic type of thinking. So that's why I kind of transformed the, the old Egyptian way to a more modern initiatory system. Um, so the way to be more conscious of their influences. Uh, the easiest way is to study um, uh, the, yeah, what they call the, the yeah, I can only I only know the Dutch term, the Uruk horoscope, so the hour angle horoscope. I don't know how to do it myself. But this is basically a technique to look at the astrological weather. So what will a certain period bring for you? And I used to know a uh, uh, astrologist who was very good at it, so he would say like in this period something will, is easy for you to happen on a relationship level or easy for you to happen on a financial level or easy for you to to work on yeah a, a consciousness level so there are certain fertile periods and by uh, knowing these fertile periods um, if you work with that part of your of your personality um, it will get a lot of positive results uh, but unfortunately I don't know how to calculate them you would have to ask a, a person who's more skilled at astrology um, the other way to become conscious of it is basically to do meditations on them. So already the Greeks had meditations which were called uh, the music of the spheres, where one by one you examine uh, and try to surpass those parts of your personality. Um, because your personality is in a way a crystallization of your, of your spirit. And by making by focusing and meditating on that part of your spirit. So for instance, uh, your sun, by meditating on your consciousness and really dissolving your consciousness and going beyond your consciousness, you reach your spiritual consciousness, which is exactly the source of that part of your personality. And if you do that with all seven planets, you can in a way destroy or liberate yourself from your um, yeah, earthly personality and really realize your spiritual personality and I think these meditation on the seven spheres is probably the, the best way to, uh, uh, to really learn about the planetary influences and how they are in harmony or in disharmony with your spirit okay I've talked for an hour and I still have four questions left um, so uh, the next question is about the bigger gifts material, emotional and spiritual are related to big responsibilities and responsibility corresponds to the size of the gift and what's my comment on that well that is a very very tricky thing um because um, there is such a thing as, as indeed earning a reward and there is also such a thing as um, stealing or uh, being lucky or being skilled. Um, so for instance if you, if you compare it to, uh, to working. So one of the things I can do is to be good at my job and work long hours and by being good at my job I don't lose my job and I might even get a little bit extra pay because I'm very skilled and by working the long hours I can generate a certain amount of money. Um, so this would be a kind of a, a skill relating to the compensation. But in many religions the gambling is forbidden uh, because gambling is also another method. So I just buy a lottery ticket and without have actually doing any work or having any skill, I can get a lot of money. 
and this is considered in a way uh, by many religions and also by me like a perversion of, uh, of the system um, because you get something which you have not worked for um, other people say well it has been given to you it is your karma so there's a big discussion is gambling evil or not is it against the divine will or not but it is another way of also achieving the same results and in very much the same way you can also gamble to get spiritual powers or certain talents um, so gambling could be for instance during the, the summer solstice is when the influence of um, yeah of the sun which is the major power and major source of transforming our consciousness is strongest so one of the ways you can gamble is to do a ritual during the summer solstice and try really to access certain powers or talents or sources of knowledge and um, there's a very big chance you go insane <laughs> but if you don't go insane you will have more power because you make contact with something which you cannot normally hold or comprehend but with or even reach or make contact to but because of your the big solar influence which strengthens your energy body you can borrow the energy from the sun you have a very strong flow of energy which is supporting you and in these ideal circumstances you can reach certain things and if you can manage to grab them and hold on to them they can become yours uh, but there's also a very big chance that you lose them or um, yeah you actually go insane damage your energy body and take months to recover so this is very much like gambling with uh, with energy um, the uh, if you look at the, the, the system of responsibility this is uh, where power matches the responsibility this is very true for the, the nature cosmos and also for the divine cosmos um, but not necessarily true for the uh, Arimanic or Luciferical cosmos. So what you see in the divine cosmos is that if a person is inspired to do a task, then usually the powers or the tools they need will be also placed upon their, upon their path. And in the same way, um, if you're given a task in a nature cosmos, then either temporarily or permanently, you're given the talents or powers to accomplish your task for the whole. So the whole doesn't see your power actually as your power, but just a power which is temporarily controlled by you. Uh, so it is not so much your power or your responsibility, it's a responsibility you choose to accept and with the job comes a certain amount of, yeah, of benefits. Um, so there you have a, a kind of a balance or a harmonious relationship between the two. If you look at the Luciferical Cosmos, this is, does not hold true at all. Um, it is about acquiring things, and acquiring things can be done in a, in a stupid way or in a smart way. So you can work a lot and practice a lot and build it up yourself. And this is like, in a way, the stable way but slow, the honest way. Or you can steal it or gamble or do other things. Uh, so one of the things you can also do is, in a way, um, yeah, receive gifts as uh, we discussed from an egregore or from a master or a teacher or a person who gives you initiation you can also receive a gift and then you also have a power which you have not really earned or which you have not really integrated and this lack of integration is also the risk you may lose the power when you reincarnate or even in between or this power can be used against you by a person who actually has more understanding or more control over that. So there is a risk in having these powers or absorbing these powers in, in this luciferical manner. If you look at the more Arimanic cosmos, um, the Arimanic cosmos also has a very strong tendency to try to, from your position of authority, to try to control all powers which are beneath you. So you will often get control over other people's talents or you can order other people to use their talents while you have no understanding of them. And uh, these other people can also be other spirits. So if, for instance, I'm part of an Arimanic egregore 
and I've reached a high position in this egregore. And even though maybe I don't know anything about energetic warfare, I can have maybe some energetic bodyguards under my command and use their powers or their talents to fight my enemies. Um, so there is a link to position and um, responsibility, but not so much to knowing or understanding these powers. And part of an egregore uh, also makes this true. So within an egregore you have a very specific role, maybe you're a healer. But if the egregore also has a martial aspect, then you can also use the fighters or the other way around. If it's a martial egregore, you're a fighter, maybe it also has a healing aspect which you can use while you're working for that egregore. So many egregores have uh, powers which they will borrow to you or make available to you um, yeah, if, you're, uh, if you're a part of them. But indeed to um, really get control over something uh, you need to in a way possess and control those energies. And what you often find if people have a lot of um, the earth element uh, they're good at yeah, controlling those types of vibration. If people have a lot of water element, they will be very skilled at controlling those types of vibration. So depending on the energy body which you currently inhabit, um, you have more or less skills in a, in a certain area, or also weak points in another area where you will need to be uh, supported. And um, the trick is you need to stabilize yourself, so you need to understand a little bit of all the elements but also to be very skilled at using your, your primary element, your most conscious element, and often using that as a, as a compensation. Uh, so for instance, in my case, my fire is dominant, and um, I'm not very good at organizing things, I'm not very good at uh, making money or being practical, but by my fire I can easily adapt myself, I can change my structure, and cope with circumstances which are which are beyond my control. So this is a way to, to use another element uh, as a compensation mechanism. Um, in general you can say that as our spirits progress we tend to incarnate in life forms which have more power, which have more complexity. So if, for instance, I do very good as a cat, I might eventually become um, a higher being. Uh, you might become a, a greater spirit or a god or a goddess, which has uh, a lot more power, a lot more skills on much more different elemental levels. But as humans, we are often very, uh, very narrow in, uh, in our skills. Um, so the next question is, um, if meeting reality we are not emotional or and sentimental, we can see all the answers in the changing environment around us. And in order to see signs and read them, this special state is needed. What are the pluses and what are the risks of this way of seeing? Well, the benefits are very, indeed very obvious. If we no longer have this uh, shroud of illusion of our false personality, of our illusions. Um, the downsides are that it requires a lot of courage to really face the world which is without illusion. So uh, we use our illusions and our categories to simplify our world. We try to create a uh, um, the illusion of control. Um, <clears throat> we like to think like, okay, I understand the system. I know what will happen next. I know what needs to be done. I have my own will, I have my own desire, and I have control over my life. This is, this, this is my illusion, if you will. But in reality, my ego, which has all these ideas, um, doesn't have this control. I am adrift on an ocean of energies and I can, my spirit can yeah, try to sail a bit or to navigate a little bit on this ocean of energies but aren't utterly 
these energies are much stronger than my skill at navigating or my power to alter or to change these uh, these flows and also my life is I have a certain freedom as a spirit but this is also limited within the envelope of my of my karma and the power of my energy body so ultimately I'm very small I'm like more like a grain of sand which is um, yeah, in a big storm and of course I can yeah, try to make myself heavy or to change my shape a little bit or to catch the wind in a different way but my power is not that big and ultimately there are bigger flows and bigger things which I have chosen as an enlightened being to be a part of but my yeah, uh, smaller self is in a way um, encapsulated by greater and greater forces so I'm both free as an enlightened being and captured as an embodied being and this is a very strange yeah, type of awareness but this type of awareness allows me to somehow to understand the choices which my higher selves have made or higher powers have made and which I'm now currently a part of and um, this amount of awareness can complicate things depending on your control of your awareness so I can give one example from my own life um, so um, one instance is that um, I noticed I, uh, I fell in love with, uh, with somebody and of course if yeah, from the ego perspective this is very nice because you have all these positive energies and infatuation and it gives you a thrill and a buzz to fall in love and I looked at it from a higher perspective and I yeah, saw that this was actually a very short term, very temporary thing. We would only see each other for a very short time, then we would break up. And of course for the ego this is yeah, very difficult because you build up attachment and then you have to let go again and you have all these dreams and they end up in disappointment. So it is very difficult in a way as an ego being to really surrender to this falling in love while knowing what will come next and it becomes very challenging to do what you should be doing and um, in a way to go into a situation which you know will cause you harm or will cause you pain but is good for you on another level and um, this surrender to the divine or to the greater powers or to um, your own spirit um, is in a way a requirement for you to, to pierce this illusion, this yeah, layer of illusion and really to read the signs and to see what lies beyond. But the, the price is also that um, um, it is hard to, to, to motivate yourself. Uh, it is not always nice to see what will be coming next. And um, For instance, if you do something without prior knowledge you will think it will end well or I will try to do something it is risky but I will come out well um, it is much harder to face your doom to do something knowing that it will go wrong knowing that you will get hurt you will get harmed and that it will have a negative result and in a way this ability to do something which will yeah, have no good consequences if you have yeah, that power, that discipline to say like I know horrible things will happen, I will get hurt, I will get sick, I will get um, maybe maimed for life or I will die but I will still do it. If you are ready to have this discipline or this surrender then it is very easy to open up to these higher levels of knowledge. But it is usually our ego and our the fears of our ego, our desire for power, desire for control, or at least these illusions of power and control which keep us back. So it is on the one hand a very easy thing to solve, but on the other hand a very difficult thing to solve. Um, oh, this is a beautiful one. The process of 
uh, what are my comments on the process of confession and what are the preconditions for a real confession and can an energetically weak person confess and also the effect of the absolute on, on a person. Uh, confession is, uh, is indeed very much in line of the process I've already, already spoken about of really surrendering to a, to a greater power. So a real confession um, actually holds, uh, holds two preconditions and one of the, the preconditions is that you are able to stop it whatever you're confessing to. Uh, so for instance if I want to confess a lie like uh, uh, Lord please forgive me because I have told a lie. If I'm not able to stop lying then this confession is not really a very useful confession. If I really consider, uh, know that I've made a mistake and I'm determined and skilled enough never to lie again then by yeah, making a confession all my past transgressions can be removed because I've learned my lesson. If I have not learned my lesson and, and will continue lying then it is not a real confession. So it does require a certain strength or energetic power to make a real confession. Um, so the best way to, yeah, the precondition is that you have to be able to stop sinning to be able to confess well. The other thing is that you're willing to pay the price, that you're willing to accept judgment. And uh, this has two aspects. One of them is self-judgment and the other is accepting the judgment from higher powers. Um, if you do not really have a regret, if you don't really uh, are willing to say like, okay, I've been a really bad person by my lying, this is a horrible thing I did, and I should be punished by it, I should face the consequences, I accept the consequences by lying, I disrupt my, uh, my harmony, with the higher powers, I separate myself from my own spirit, from the absolute, from the collective consciousness. I really see the harm I've done to myself and I accept that I've hurt myself, I've destroyed the harmony of my energy body and I'm willing to bear the damage and repair the damage and to try to, to fix it. So this is the first level of accepting judgment, that you accept responsibility for what you've done and work to, to compensate it, to set it right again. And um, the next level is that by what I've done, by my lies, I've also harmed not just myself but also others and higher powers. So there are, there's for instance Jesus Christ who tries to guide me but I'm an idiot, I make lies and I disturb my relationship with Jesus Christ and he has to go through extra efforts to try to compensate and to make sure that my lies don't harm me too much, they don't harm others too much and they don't upset the general status and balance of the universe too much. So I have to apologize and to set right not just things for myself internally but also, also be willing to set things right between me and all my victims. So this real contrition, this real feeling of I want to set things right is very very necessary and often a condition of uh, this act of confession for the forgiveness is also that you at least uh, make some things right and often we've built up such a huge debt that it would take many lifetimes to, to set everything right. But these higher powers, if they see that you are, have the skill, the willingness, the discipline to do this, they will do pretty much 90%, 80% for us. But we really have to do the 10 or 20%. And we really have to seek out the power and the skill and the purity to really perfect ourselves on this level. So you really have to have a strong willingness to create, to lift yourself up to the level which is necessary. Um, so an energetically weak person um, 
can confess, but the process of the, the receiving the forgiveness um, can be yeah, rather long. Uh, if they have enough uh, willpower, then they will be guided in the process of growth in, in self-transformation so that they will not sin again. But uh, often for an energetically weak person, the confession will not immediately bring forgiveness, but it ra will rather bring lessons. So the karmic debt won't be washed away yet until the person is able to stop sinning. And uh, I want to just explain also a sin is anything which disturbs your harmony, your contact with the divine or with your spirit or between yourselves and higher parts of the cosmos or higher parts of yourself. So this is what comprises a sin. So it is not much something which is considered socially wrong or morally wrong, um, but um, really harms you in a spiritual sense. Um, oh yes, um, yeah, um, I'm just being reminded that um, uh, yeah, there are a few things, practical things to, uh, to talk about. Um, one of the things is basically uh, the time, um, because uh, uh, I don't know which time is, is best for everybody. We picked Wednesday, but I know that at least Nienke has problems now with the Wednesday. And I do have other evenings available, so I will just send a little questionnaire around via email later to check out a little bit. Uh, what what would be uh, the best time or and, uh, day of the week for everybody. Um, another thing is also that I will be starting a course here in Breda. Um, but yeah, that's, since most people are living quite far away, that's not very, uh, very useful. Uh, but if people want to try, right now it is really focused on questions, but if people want to go more deeply into a certain topic or go step by step into a certain topic that's also a direction we could take with these uh, with these lessons um, so the other thing is indeed about the the absolute um, that if the absolute touches a person they would turn into a pile of ash they would be burned and um, so, is it an honor to be burned or not? <laughs> Should we try to be burned or not? Well, that's an interesting uh, issue, because if we um, look, for instance, at the, at the Vedic uh, tradition, uh, so the Indian religions, they uh, really focus on this process of uh, being saved by destruction. Um, Shiva uh, burning us and thereby removing all our bonds and all our illusions. And there are various ways of being crushed or decapitated by Kali. Um, so yes, this is true, but it is also not true. Because every destruction of, uh, uh, of our energy bodies um, in a way frees our spirit, so it goes to a higher level of consciousness. So by destroying, 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 or by letting go, or uh, non-attachment, in the Buddhist sense, we liberate ourselves and our consciousness goes to a higher level. But what we mustn't forget is also that our consciousness has descended for a reason. We are in physical bodies because we have either a desire to be here or we have impurities which are not resolved yet. And these impurities often come from a higher level. So by destroying our body, I'm free of my... yeah. Uh, physical impurities but if there is for instance a very strong desire for me to stroke my cat and I have a very big attachment to my cat then I will have to reincarnate together with my cat to stroke it again and the higher level which may be in my spirit um, or which may be a larger mission to yeah, incarnate as a human being because I like being human 
is not resolved by, by killing myself or by destroying myself. So the destruction we experience by the influence of higher energies or higher powers, like the Absolute, does liberate us, but it doesn't guarantee a continual liberation. And to get this more continual liberation, every problem has to be dealt with on the correct level. Um, so we have to, to deal with all our tendencies, with all our identifications. So it is not just an identification with the body, but also with my emotions, with my humanity, with my personality, with my power, with the solar system, um, with all the gods and the goddesses. All these things have to be resolved for me ultimately to reach enlightenment. And when I have enlightenment, I still have to let go of my own desires, my own willpower, to be able to yeah, get some inkling of the will of the Absolute. And even then, even an angel is burned if it is exposed to the entirety of the Absolute, because it is still limited, it is still um, yeah, diminished. But this process of evolution is indeed by contact with the higher powers, because every time we are in contact with the higher energy, part of my lower self can melt a little bit, can dissolve a little bit. And um, also the contact with the higher power gives me a guidance of what it is like to be dissolved, to be free. So it stimulates us, it awakens our hunger for the higher. So for instance, if I, uh, if I pray and I have a vision or I see a mission or whatever, then I get this feeling of what it would be like to be a free spirit and to live in accordance with God or this higher mission. And even though I still have like physical things like pain in my foot or I'm hungry or I'm tired or other things, there is a desire to surpass all these lower distractions and to keep focusing on this higher power. And I can use this higher vision to also um, release myself from this hunger, from this pain in my foot, from this tiredness and realize these are just illusions of the body which I have to deal with but which are not really me, that this higher path, this higher focus is actually uh, the reality and that this pain and tiredness is an illusion which only exists in these lower realities. And. Um, it inspires me also to develop a skill in these lower realities, of like how to spend the minimum amount of time and effort in not being in pain, in not being tired, in not being pressed for cash. And uh, thereby my skill at being in these lower realities is also inspired by desiring to live a spiritual life. Um, so the spiritual life and the material life can be in competition but spiritual experience should actually stimulate me to develop more material skills and become a better yeah, physical human as well as a better spiritual human. Um, it is also very dependent upon the, the purpose of our spirit. Um, if we should be working on this process of purification, which is the process of evolution, of becoming more spiritual, more harmonized as, uh, as I go along in life, or if I should spend my time in a process of involution, of manifestation, that in a way I should attract more lower energies, more lower vibrations to develop my skill in working with them with, and develop a skill at incarnating and being in a form. Um, so, for instance, one of the things in, in my life, um, I was, yeah, when I was young, I did not have understandings at all of certain aspects of my life or certain sins, like um, things like um, uh, greed or envy, for instance. I had no concept of greed or envy, and this made it very difficult because I have no ambition. Uh, to have things another person have, has or to have more. And I, if I compete with other people who do have those ambitions, I always end up last 
because I'm always weakest, because I don't even understand the game they're playing. I have no concept of why people are doing things or how things are done. So I had to focus for several years on trying to get an understanding and develop these skills. And these skills are not good for my spiritual development and they create a kind of a tension and disharmony between my ego and my spirit. But they're necessary for my life here on this planet to be able to focus on, uh, on the material world and to be able to compete with other people on the material, on the material plane. And um, yeah, without these skills my life would be yeah, very, very difficult. And in other times I could just go into a monastery and I would be supported, I would be fed, I would not have to develop these material skills. But as we go towards a system of individualization, uh, more and more every spirit has to learn how to deal with all the aspects of life. We have to increase our ability to deal with the complexity and also not to lose sight of our mission. So this is a very challenging situation we are in because I'm very good at what I do but I'm also very bad at other things. And one of the things I have to learn to get an understanding so I can have some inkling of what I need but I also um, don't have to do everything myself. I have to specialize on my strong points, on my mission and not become a banker or somebody else who's totally involved just with money. Because then I would lose my way, I would get lost into this illusionary material. So I need to find people who are good at making money and try to cooperate with them and uh, share my strength and use their strength to compensate for my weakness. So this is really the type of society which we should be aspiring to build, where actually they have one half of the puzzle, I have another half of the puzzle. And together we can create a perfect and harmonious cosmos. But it requires a lot of understanding of each other. And this level of universal understanding is actually what is our goal as humanity for the next like 1500 years to try to, uh, to build up.